Are we ready? Session's been recorded. <laughs> Morning. Morning, everybody. Yeah. We're, we're usually quite excited, aren't we? We are. But yes. we're, we're, we're still, I mean, it's, excited. it's doubly excited. We've got our waffle t shirts on today. Yep. Now, we're not going to tell people what's happening in the in the waffle, in, in the behind the scenes in Waffle World, but we. That's been why you've been very excited. Very excited. It will become clear once we've got, we've got two waffles in the can, haven't we? We have. And they are amazing canned waffles. Yep. Who would have thought it? Yep. It's going to be brilliant. It is. But. We will say no more. No. No Let's more just... about it today. So I'm Jane. You're Chris. I'm Chris Morrison. I work at the University of Kent. Um, and you are? For the next month. For the next month. But yeah, and a bit, a little bit. And I'm Jane Secker and I work at City University and we're the Cool SIG co-chairs. So what's Cool SIG? What does that stand for? Copyright and online learning. That's all. What, the special interest group? Yes. What, yes. So can people... And I think we might have a newsletter going out. We do? So okay. So if you're not on the mailing list, they yeah. get on there quick. So it's going out start of next week it's going out okay so maybe we could have a link to the cool sig um somewhere somebody out there you must have a link to the cool De sig Deborah can pop that there's in somebody us, sure. a part of our group with yes. the whole gang of us so yes um, but let's get cracking what have we got lined up that. today okay um so we've got a load of copyright news some good stuff we won't say it now because we will go through it um yeah. as we come but the today's session we've been really looking forward to for a long time because we have Roxanne and Eleanor joining us from University of Arts London um, and they're doing some really cool stuff mm -hmm. um, and it's really it, it, it's topics that they'll be talking about that comes up all the time about students particularly design art students Absolutely. and how they, how they deal with copyright issues and uh, and what 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 they've been doing is is really innovative yep. uh, and really great so really looking forward to that absolutely yeah so, but without further ado without further ado so we can not hog the stage for much longer okay we better get on with okay. that no hogging All right <laughs> first. let's go to yeah let's get to go to the first bit so this is a room oh since we last met what's been happening <laughs> so well quite a lot of things actually quite but a lot of things lots of things we didn't want to talk about yet because the the, the waffle, the candy well, waffle. The, we, we said we wouldn't about. talk about no, that no, no, no. okay yes. but uh, where have you been i've been i actually what's that big round building? why is that big the the radcliffe camera i have actually been up isn't that the body to oxford and i have visited the 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 news last week was that i am leaving university of kent and i will be starting as the copyright and licensing specialist at bodleian libraries at the end of april my start date is the 25th of april but i actually for the first time uh, the weekend before last actually went up and actually that's not you in your high vis in that's that not me no i'm taking i don't think photo. where high vis i don't think high vis tweed works no well so. we'll have to we'll have to see how that goes yeah. maybe we can get a highly reflective 21st century cravat tweed. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. So yeah, I did that and I met up with uh, Ruth uh, Malaloo, who's my new boss um, and well known to this uh, parish. I don't know if you're there today, Ruth, but anyway, it's so exciting. I'm going to stop talking about it now and hand over to you. So what have you been up to? I've been doing a lot of work for charity. Have you? Okay. Yeah. No, well, I did. I did a 10k. I did. I don't. I don't. Mm -hmm. But no, I did a, a 10k run um, with my running club on Sunday um, and uh, all the money that we when we entered the race all went to um, the, the Ukrainian crisis. So uh, we're going to come back to that topic. But um, I'm really quite pleased, actually, with my running as well. You're was, doing really well. I was motivated. You're doing very well. For an old lady, you're doing pretty good. I'm just moving on from that. OK. So we've actually updated this slide. We have. Eventually. For the first we, time in two years. Yeah, so it, we have got the full archive of all the Blackboard Collaborate links. So you can see the full thing with all the chat and experience it as if you were part of the webinar. But we've also now got, thank you very much to Christina Vines, who's been uh, plugging these into YouTube, taking the recordings. Um, and it's now on the Alt Copyright and Online Learning SIG uh, YouTube playlist. Mm -hmm. So you actually can see all of these as they come up. I just popped a link into the chat. Um, and so... of course, once it's on YouTube, it's a bit, it kind of become. Um, we'll get all the takedown notices. You, well, we'll see. We'll see what we include <laughs> in the content. Um, so that's there. Okay. Right. Ready? Ready Next to one. go? I think we're Cued ready. Up. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Mm. So you, you got me here. Uh, yes, absolutely. Let's go. Copyright news. 
Okay, so the first item of news, Catherine is actually pointing out that there are reflective tweed jackets. You're going to check those out later. Yeah, we are, we'll definitely I, I need do that, that, Catherine. Send me that link. Send me that. Send it's there. there it is. Okay, let's not look at it now. No. Let's remind. Huge distraction. Yeah, a reminder of Fair Dealy Week was an absolute thundering, rip roaring success, wasn't it? It was great. It was it really was good. It was exhausting. It's going to be even <laughs> better next, next year. It's we did say better. to everyone, hey, let's do this thing. We don't necessarily have to be involved in everything, but let's get the idea going. Play the theme tune, and like course, the theme tune. And of course, we couldn't help get involved in everything, and it was yeah. marvellous to be to be involved. But to see such a... So you can see the different recordings are up there. Mm -hmm. All those events that happened showed really different aspects of how fair dealing impacts on... On different areas and it was definitely and really and good. we yeah some really great sessions the session where we uh the kent session where we had the discussion at the end with ben marsh mm, mm. was a lot of fun um so if anyone's interested in parody songs and how that works yeah it's it's something we hadn't ever thought about before had we not really no <laughs> no 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 okay so next item up on our list um uh, some of you have probably already seen this, um, but um, Emily Hudson um, emailed Liz CopySeek, I think, a couple of weeks ago with this, but she's updated her guidance for uh, using films, audiovisual works and images in online teaching. Um, so it's on the SSRN site as a sort of pre-print paper. I'll pop the link into the chat for uh, those of you who haven't seen it, but you can get these uh, links out of the slides uh, later on this afternoon as well if you want them. Um, but really good to see that guidance, which has obviously been really important um, for those of us who um, are, are teaching using audiovisual material. I mean, who isn't really, to be honest, but particularly images as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just covering film. Um, so she's got some great guidance. So she's got there. some great guidance. Oh, sorry, I apologise. I am. Um going to mute oh that was horrible just be joining the session that was horrible don't do that i don't need to hear myself <laughs> no, chris instead. morrison number two has just joined the I session don't need to hear and interrupted the stereo okay. okay okay next up chris oh yeah uh, so the one. abc conference is the uh canadian copyright in education and research and libraries conference it's been running for a number of years and they do have some call for proposals out and they are running it um with online um, in a hybrid in, form. in a hybrid format so yeah. you can put in it's a pretty tight deadline isn't it the 15th no i think it's i think it's actually the 13th i think it's sunday oh right okay so, so that's my week that's my weekend gone anybody that we will be putting in a proposal we want to just hey what's going on over here yeah um but yeah anyone else that wants to to um Put something in for that it's there it's yeah i think i think it's going to be i mean i suspect that a lot of the online stuff i think it'll be free to participate i think they've uh, got okay. places for a hundred people to go it's in london ontario mm -hmm. so it's a bit of a, a trek actually so um you may want to think about if you want to participate doing that remotely so mm -hmm. as travel still a bit, bit more tricky um okay next up um was a, a fascinating case um, that uh, was picked up actually um, by Sandy Dukchat originally from who's at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies who we ran the Fair Dealing Week event with um, but it appealed to me particularly about these uh, Only Fools and Horses evening um, events the Kushti dining events because my mum had just been on one um, and she'd been going on and on and on about it and it hadn't really occurred to me that this wouldn't have been done under some sort of um, licensed activity actually um, but um, yeah if you didn't see the story Chris has put the link in um, to the Guardian story um, that they, they actually ended up in court and um, um, it's basically sort of saying, you know, I think it, it, it's 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 quite a sort of landmark case because it's it's about use of um, parody and pastiche yeah. that we haven't had in the UK. I mean, uh, there are there have been cases. I'm thinking about there's a US case about a Seinfeld board game that was was it fair use or not? It wasn't official and licensed. So I think it will be similar arguments coming out. So we're going to do a kind of parody copyright um, like webinar in an only fools and horses theme do you think which which character do you want to play Marley. <laughs> <laughs> let's carry on yeah. <laughs> next up i think uh are you going to talk about this one? Yeah, the, yeah this i mean this came out this was in february that this uh news about research gate um and elsevier and american chemical society it's around 
the articles that are held on the ResearchGate site and uh, this nature is the uh, article is the latest one to discuss it and uh, it's it's still an, an ongoing thing to pick through what's come out of it uh, as with these court cases there's rarely a clear definitive this is this is what happens when people share things through research but this, this headline sites. read to me like mm. a line out of the publishing trap yeah yeah they so basically it is clear that research gates are to there is liability for mm. having that content on there but it's, it's raised a number of questions around do uh if there's a joint authored work does the corresponding author have the right to then um represent all the authors on it so it'll be one to to watch and so i would say read that um and uh yeah yeah that, that's thought we'd raise that because that's clearly um an important area to keep an eye on yeah yeah and the final one we we we, we don't want to dwell too much on this we know that this is uh, really difficult and, and you know we're, we're all looking at what's happening in the world today um and and are very saddened by by what's happening we thought we'd pick up a couple of things the first piece here eiffel um and in fact irina kuchma who works for eiffel is currently she, she she's ukrainian she's in there she's not far from kiev she's staying with her family there um and she's written this piece talking about what libraries are doing how they're trying to support um their communities both uh physically as keep as places they can go as well as the work to try to keep communications going yeah and keep their cultural life on going and and you know we we met her really didn't we when we went to Kyrgyzstan yeah 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 um, yeah, yeah so that thing, when when I saw been her following on Twitter really it's yeah. really brings it home when it's also someone you've met and you know really well and mm. they're putting tweets of their kind of neighborhood all bombed out it's horrible not, really upsetting not not much more we can really say about that but no. we did want to also uh, point to the um, SILIP uh, post the pages. Yeah, so uh, I, had, I had a little bit of a, a hand in helping to put together the combating disinformation um, flyer that the SILIP put together. They've got a kind of hub with um, information um, about um, the war in Ukraine and um, uh, the, the, the kind of things that are happening um, with the Ukraine Library Association as well. So Nick Poole's been in quite a lot of contact with them about it. I think he's also um, gone quite viral on social media based on um, some of the things he's he's been tweeting about librarians. Um, and, you know, they're kind of, their sort of strength at a really difficult time. So, um, but if you want to have a look at the SILIP pages, it does tell you um, the kinds of things that you can do. Obviously, it's got links through to, to where you can donate um but sort of the 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 kind of important area around this information um and you know just it's kind of really brought it home to me i was just reading an article this morning about all the different countries around the world and the different ways that they're reporting on it and kind of it, it's it's you know as ever it's it, with with any situation there's many many viewpoints and kind of trying to get to the truth of what's going on is 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 obviously something a lot of reporters are trying to do so yeah but um diff difficult times definitely so so what we should we move on then yeah to the to the main topic of yes because we are very excited about having um our guests roxanne and eleanor speaking this morning yes. and we don't want to take up any more time no it's we now. don't we've got the, the piece that they shared with us earlier and we shared with you last time around and we let you know there, there it is but in fact much better than a two-page spread are the authors themselves so can we check roxanne and eleanor are you with us let's just uh stop sharing Hoping she's there. Yes, I am. I'm sorry. Uh, Hello. <laughs> Can't share my video though. What's happened? We're going. Oh, to, you were there a minute you were ago. There, so you? Yeah. I think you're oh, there. there you are. Are. You've Excellent. arrived. Hello. Oh. And then. And we've got Eleanor as well. Hi, Eleanor. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, shall we get there? There. We'll get slide. your slides up. Yep. Yes. We'll get your we slides up, do. and we'll yeah. hand over to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah shares share file oh, you, know what I'm you know what you're doing <laughs> you know what i'm doing <laughs> just just a little bit of patience say a few nice right. pleasantries about okay. the times we've met roxanne we were we looking have. for photos actually of some of the fun times we've had together the creative commons <laughs> summit and things like that so yeah 
Okay, here are your slides and uh, it's over to you. So thank you so much for um, joining us this morning. And I think you should have control of those slides, Roxanne and, and Eleanor, we've got. So um, we'll, we'll hand over IP education, ideas, identity and impact. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, Faith, and thank you. It's so nice to finally connect with this particular community. It's been a long time coming and we're really happy to come and um, hopefully give you a bit of an insight into the work that we're doing and just really share our thinking and, you know, hopefully moving forward, we can um, stay more connected with everybody. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, sort of sharing some of this with you. Um, just before we um, go into, dive into the slides, um, just sort of be nice to just um, introduce ourselves because I feel like I might have met some of you over the years um, before I was at the university, I worked in the cultural heritage sector. So I spent a long time, I'm almost like a lifer <laughs> at the um, at the V&A, so museum background. And then I also worked for Europeana Foundation for a few years. So I've always been really, uh, I kind of fell into copyright by mistake, which might not come as a surprise to some people. It often seems to happen that way in institutions, but I was working in image licensing, so worked within enterprise for a while and then moved across to collections management. Um, but I got to the point where I was really keen to support creatives that were starting out where there isn't any IP education as part of their curriculum. Um, so yeah, I come to UAL and I think what's really nice in terms of what we're going to share today, um, working with Elle, I'll let her tell you a bit more about her background, but I think it's been really for me personally very rewarding connecting with a recent um, London College of Fashion graduate so one of our colleges and kind of shaping our thinking together so Elle if you're there if you wanted to just um, say hi and what what you do and your background yes um, so hello my name is Elle and um, I have been working with Roxanne at UAL for the last year which seems to have gone super fast um, prior to that, I studied law at the University of Plymouth, um, very different to living in London. Um, it was quite a culture shock to um, then study for a master's at LCF where nobody wore flip flops. Um, there was no the odd wetsuit in a lecture and nobody drank cider all afternoon outside irrespective of the weather. Um, so that was my culture shock from um, studying law at Plymouth to doing a master's in fashion management at London College of Fashion. Um, when I finished um, my four years of education, I went to work for a fashion technology startup that really was trying to explore different ways of um, supporting um, early stage designers in protecting their rights um, by using um, blockchain and looking at NFTs and licensing in different ways that they can really diversify their offering. Um, so after I worked for that startup for a little while, I then um, met with Roxanne and we worked on um, an intellectual property module for UAL. And then shortly after that, I um, fell into this job, I guess. Um, it will all become a bit clearer as we go through our presentation, um, what we offer at UAL. So I'll hand back to Roxanne um, to carry on with. So yeah, in, in the time that we've got together, we just wanted to tell you a bit more about who we are, which we will continue to um, explore through this session and um, who we're supporting, how our students and graduates are working in practice. Because um, I think um, one thing that I feel is quite key to the work that we do is we're very much being informed by what our creatives are asking, their sort of wants and needs and their sort of ambitions with some of the amazing work they want to actually you know, carry out in, in industry and really thinking about our future vision for inclusive IP education. So um, for those of you that might not be familiar with the University of Arts London, um, it comprises of six colleges, including Central St Martins, London College of Fashion, and then there's London College of Communication, Chelsea, Wimbledon and Camberwell. So it comprises art, design and communication in its broadest sense. And there's 19,000 plus students according to the uh, website so I don't know how many officially there are at the moment um, international students as well as home students and then over 230 courses 
um, all with very different cultures in the colleges, right down to the courses, right down to our course leaders. And just to say we are we are the IP education team across the whole of the university. So an L is only part time as well. Um, so you can imagine it's quite I've been there four years and it's been quite sort of interesting trying to find ways to dance around the curriculum when when IP and kind of copyright education isn't kind of embedded in that way. So that's just to give you a bit of an insight. And the other thing to say um, is we are based in the careers and employability team. So everything that we're going to um, share with you is very much focused towards our students and graduates rather than being staff facing. And that's not to say that we don't support staff, but our role is really to support staff. <laughs> Please do sing, Chris, if you want to. <laughs> um, yeah, our, our role in supporting staff is to really help them um, have an understanding of intellectual property in terms of how it's going to support their students within their um, projects, within their portfolios and showcasing, and then kind of supporting them going out into professional practice. So we're sort of in a slightly different role to, say, people that are working in digital literacy um, in supporting staff with like teaching and learning materials in that way. So yeah, in terms of how we kind of, I guess, position ourselves and really Elle and I have been really kind of, it's evolving all the time for us. So as we're sharing this with you now, it is always kind of ex very exploratory, which I guess comes with the territory of working somewhere like the University of Arts, which really encourages, you know, being very innovative and thinking outside of the box I guess so I think we kind of position ourselves as educators thinkers and strategists and as I said before I think it's for us it's really important that we connect with creatives understanding how they think what's motivating them you know what their values and visions are within their work to help support them develop their creative identity and then help them understand the intellectual property in its broadest sense as well as obviously copyright um, can play an active role as agency for healthy ethical engagement and effective collaboration and and I've put why now here because I think there's still and it probably resonates with some of you in terms of sometimes getting not buy-in as such from senior management but it's really sometimes quite invisible the work we're doing on the ground even though we know we're sort of making inroads at a very kind of on the ground um, level um, but I think particularly with the global impact of COVID-19 and really thinking about our, our, you know, our students and grads having that agency to really, you know, a lot of them are very motivated by, you know, climate emergency or looking at areas within social justice. And really there's a lot for them to really benefit from understanding the kind of relational role that intellectual property can play in practice when they're creating content, collaborating and you know, communicating within different um, fields and industries. So I think in terms of historically how IP has been taught, and Elle mentioned she did her undergrad in law, I also did a postgrad in copyright law um, a bit later. And I think, um, I guess where we position ourselves differently is historically IP has, you know, understandably it's based on case law, very, very important. But I think in terms of, you know that legal language things can seem quite inaccessible or people feel it's quite a barrier to actually accessing information or understanding things in a kind of relatable way and i think in terms of when i was looking at other roles like mine when i started at university i realized there wasn't really anything similar because often ip is taught to um future law professionals or those starting a business um when really the people that we feel would really benefit having worked in copyright law for so long as well are the creatives and innovators that we have the opportunity to connect with. So in the here and now, I think we're really focused on the people and the practice. For us, the people are really central to us being able to then support. And then we kind of blend key principles um, with really meeting people, whether it's one-to-ones, which we're having a lot of at the moment, um, and we also kind of go in and do sessions co-designing with course leaders, which Elle's going to speak about in a bit, to really help um, really help students build confidence. You know, we're not there to give them answers, but we're there to help them make informed decisions and have an awareness of, of 
sort of their behavior within these kind of professional spaces. And in terms of, again, again, really focusing on the fact we are here for creatives, it's really trying to understand how they're really working and, you know, where there might be gaps or where there might be gaps in our knowledge as much as, as what they need support with. Um, and they're all, you know, working in international, interdisciplinary and innovative spaces. They might end up becoming business owners themselves or they will be employed by someone else or they might also be employing others. Um, they may be developing products, platforms, practices. So not everyone that we work with is going to create a tangible, um, you know, artwork or a design. It could be something where they're creating an agency or a, um, something in the metaverse. The, the NFT conversation is very current at the moment. Um, and they may co-create, collaborate and connect with others in industries and there's a real emphasis, I think, on this kind of community and capacity building as well, where things are not about the economics of IP always, but how, um, you know, it's not their primary driver, the economics. It's much more about the social impact they can make. And I just wanted to share this because this was um, something that happened quite early on at UAL. And it was the first time it made me realise that it's not linear teaching intellectual property and copyright it's really and it's not just getting people prepared for when they you know go out into practice because in this instance and some of you might know this um graduates work because it went viral on twitter overnight and an instagram and he hadn't done his final show at Central St. Martins, so he hadn't really had an opportunity to think about his reputation or how he benefits and positions himself when he had so much exposure so quickly. And it was the first time it really made me think about, you know, the students' well-being and how copyright and intellectual property can actually have a bearing on how they best manage their reputation and thinking about safeguarding that students you know we have that duty of care to support them um, so he came to have a meeting with me and we sat down and thought about how he might respond to all of this exposure that he'd had from so many people um, and what's really interesting is when he did his final show at central st martin's bearing in mind it's such an internationally renowned um course and you know people from industry are always coming in to sort of check out the students work he was very keen not to give away how he made these dresses fit over the model's head because when the models walk down the catwalk the material that you can see on the screen gets sort of sucked over their bodies so it was interesting I went to see what he had exhibited and following our conversation I didn't tell him what to do he made these decisions himself but because he knew everyone would want to see his work he just had his email address on a post-it on a table and that was literally all that was displayed and I just thought it was quite quite a good um, example to share because it really helped me make a case for the university as to the value of IP education across the board and when we need to think about how to reach people so I know that you will have had the article and this about the um, IP module and this came out of me <laughs> came out of me sitting in my in lockdown partly um, and being given some budget and being told to do something with it because obviously we like a lot of us weren't able to be on site and we were trying to ensure we were still being able to engage in a meaningful way um, so as Elle said we met during that time and Elle and I worked to co-design um, an online IP resource which is non-linear to reflect creative practice, that idea that people can look at it as and when they need to. We wanted to create something that students and graduates would actually want to, you know, want to look at when they want to. So it was creating relatable, relevant and real experiences. So um, there's lots of case studies from grads. I think it's really important that the student voices are heard and they can connect with each other and really learn from each other. Um, and I think um, Elle won't mind me saying this, but I've, I've really noticed when we do sessions together, um, given Elle has only recently graduated herself and can share her very fresh experiences, it's really interesting um, how engaged, not that they're not engaged with me, but I have to say the students really very 
the very business focused um, students as well, given Elle's background, I think they learned so much from that extra insight from her. And as I've reinforced this confidence building to make informed choices, I think is really important. We're kind of working in almost like compassionate pedagogy. I think we're really keen to, to feel that we're there as a sounding board sometimes. Um, but these are some screenshots from the module. And as I said, we tried to make it very interactive, tried not to just make it too legal. There's lots of links to lots of amazing resources that you will all be familiar with. Um, and then I'm just going to hand over to Elle now, who's going to talk through some of the things that we get asked about and to share some of our, uh, some case studies from some of our, our grads. Well, so um, yeah, we get asked a lot of questions. Um, they come in different forms. Um, it might be some direct inquiries from staff or students that come straight into our inbox. It might be questions that we get asked in sessions, um, or it might be that we connect with students in different ways. So depending on um, which students um, we have questions from, the topics can hugely vary. So um, if students are in the um, creating stages of their projects, which might be at any time in their degree, they might be interested in finding out more about using other people's work. And um, well, they might be interested in finding out how um, their IP works when they are doing internships and placements and things like that, um, because they might have been asked to sign contracts and not read them and other things like that. Um, often showcasing and sharing your work is a really big topic of questions for us as um, throughout their time at UAL students will be um, asked and expected to showcase or share their work in certain forms. It might be a work in progress show or it might be um, a portfolio project where their submission for the unit is a, um, a visual portfolio. A lot of the work that um, I do with the students is um, looking at starting a business um, as I have a business myself and I have worked for a couple of different startups. So um, I offer support on the starting a business side of things in one to one sessions, um, which quite often goes towards the trademark registration side of things and obviously collaborating and um, working with others at UAL and also externally to UAL is a really central aspect of so many different um, creatives work. So I just wanted to share a few examples of um, students and graduates that we have worked with recently. Um, so Cassie is a Central St Martins graduate and everything um, obviously apart from um, the potatoes in the bag um, on the screen are made from um, flax seed um, and then the little sequins at the front on the top image are um, seaweed sequins. So Cassie did a um, master's in biodesign at Central St Martins um, so all her work was focused on innovative materials um, mostly for the fashion industry. So Cassie came to us and asked um, you know I've got these amazing innovative materials and I want to know how I can protect them. I want to know when I should share things with people, what I should keep secret, how I can really protect my ingredients and my recipe. And it was really interesting to hear how she framed things like that, you know, all of these amazing materials on the screen and um, what it comes down to is a certain set of ingredients and uh, a recipe that she'd worked for many years to define. So we supported Cassie um, in really thinking about how she shares her work with different groups of people and how that might impact her business decisions, as well as su supporting her in building a network that she could um, work collaboratively with. Um, she has recently had her sequins featured in London Fashion Week um, as part of a collaboration with British designer Priya Alawalia. Um, I'll share that link as soon as I've stopped talking. Um, because I can't do two things at once. Um, so that just shows some insight into um, one of the one-to-one -one meetings that Roxanne and I have had in the last few months. Another one of those is Sara. Um, so Sara is a ceramicist graduate from also from Central St Martins and um, Sara created a method for 
um, diverting industrial waste from landfill and turning um, that into 100% recycled from industrial waste ceramics. Um, and she, as part of her final major project, created a book called Circular Ceramics. She really wanted to focus on accessibility and transparency to allow others to use her process. From um, looking at things from a sustainability perspective, she didn't want to protect this um, so heavily that others couldn't use it because from a sustainability process um, and perspective, what's the point of um, trying to make something sustainable and then keeping it all to yourself? So um, she released her book um, under a Creative Commons license. Um, Sara came to us when she was having um, some issues with crediting and being credited properly by others who had used her process. Um, so it was a really interesting experience for Roxanne and I to hear more about why she had chosen to um, release her work in this way and um, you know how she wanted to make an impact from her work. Um, and they're just two examples. Um, we could go on and on with some amazing case studies from our students. So um, another part of the work that we do alongside offering one to ones is offering in um, in class um, sessions. So we go along to um, sessions within a course or a unit and provide them with an IP session. One of the things we've been trialing since September is co-designing sessions. So these are some examples of an online session that I did with a strategic fashion management course at London College of Fashion. Um, I was asked to um, focus on collaborating, um, innovation and diversification of fashion brands. And I worked really closely with the course leader to co-create a session that allowed students to explore um, key IP um, un understanding and um, IP rights um, within the context of the unit they were currently studying. Um, so I had students collaborating with each other in groups and using lots of examples um, from the luxury fashion industry to help explore their different ideas. Um, and we've offered lots of co-designed co -designed, um, sessions this term, ranging from illustration to journalism to fashion management and probably a lot more that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so the scope is absolutely huge. Um, Roxanne, I will hand back over to you. Um, if you wanted to add any other co-design sessions that we have done yeah. this term. Yeah, well, just just to share with everyone as well. It's a, you know, in case anyone is interested in how we how we work with the courses we do. Um, I actually asked this in my job interview because I thought, how do how am I meant to reach all of these <laughs> people? And you know, you want to be inclusive and you want to make sure you know as much as you can sort of get reach everybody. Um, and this was pre the module, but I think really in practice, it sometimes is you know connecting with like-minded people or it's word of mouth course leader to course leader so because Elle obviously has a connection with London College of Fashion already she's been making a lot of um, uh, progress there and you know if this chimes with any of you I think it's that thing of I sometimes get so overwhelmed at you know the, the potential that we have and not to just say oh well, there's only two of us we can't you know possibly do it all and trying to be realistic and starting small and doing like pilot things so um when Elle's been doing more of the fashion and business courses I'm I'm much more I guess my experience and my motivations are much more around the um intersection between IP and ethics as well so I think a lot of the courses that are more sort of focused on visual culture I think um so there's been um courses you know whether it's photography or animation or documentary film um design for art direction which it sounds quite a nebulous course and it is quite a nebulous course but it's often more about students as I said earlier that don't make products as such or are not setting up businesses but it's more their sort of sense of self and their motivations to make a difference in some way and so it's trying to I guess unpick and identify which and it's normally copyright that might come up and I was going to just talk about that 
you know, the considerations for any of them creating any sort of content, be it that they need to get consent when they're interviewing people, for example, making sure they're fairly representing a community that they've just been, you know, connecting with, or if they want to, um, you know, we get this a lot, um, and I was going to say this with these slides, I think the questions we're getting a lot around things around either people worrying that someone's going to rip them off, um, but it might be if they post things online, but also us really being um, there to support them when they want to take to their platforms to maybe call someone out because they feel that they've been unfairly represented. And so part of L and I's role increasingly is to, I guess, make them think before they press send or <laughs> put a comment that could go viral in a way that might not be considered appropriate. It kind of, I guess, touches upon things around, you know, misinformation as well and just people really being mindful of, of their actions through what they're creating and, and the way they're sort of presenting themselves reputationally. So yeah, I guess in terms of bringing it back to kind of copyright implications, I think, as I said, we get a lot around We've just had a few a few one to ones in the last week where one of our graduates, um, this happens a lot, people intern at big brands and big brands often go, thank you for your portfolio and then say, oh, we don't want to work with you now. And our students have seen potentially copycat designs on catwalks in shows and things like that. So we get a lot of those sorts of things coming through. Um, I've just had one recently from students that did fashion and styling production which as as you will all know um you can only copyright something if it's fixed in a tangible way which makes makeup and styling quite problematic sometimes um unless they you know recognize the value in the images they've taken of their um style um so we've had that recently and then I think the other big area that's really coming to the fore um, around conversations around decolonization in its broadest sense um, it is appropriating other people's content. So whether it's people that are working with artisan communities and ensuring that they understand, um, you know, kind of the roles and responsibilities and respect within these communities to ensure that they're fairly represented and credited. Um, another example that um, we had the other day is a student that's entering a competition and we have a lot of people entering competitions and she wanted to know whether she needed to seek permission to incorporate a photograph that she'd sourced from Unsplash which some of you might be familiar with but it's essentially a, a an image site that's got set licensing terms clearly stated as to what you can do with the images featured on it. Um, so she contacted me because the photograph she wants to repurpose actually features somebody um, and she wanted to know whether she should contact the photographer out of courtesy. So it's great that she was already thinking about, you know, when she might get permission and thinking about the context of the way things are being represented, which I think Elle and I are finding a lot more that this sense of how are you actually using something? What is it you're using it for? You know, why are you using this part of someone's work? And is it actually, um, you know, more about freedom of artistic expression and it's got a very, you know, kind of social or political kind of message in it over any commercial intent? So in terms of our future vision, we're chipping away <laughs> at this at this beast of a, um, you know, great space to be very, very lucky to be working in. but. We really do want to encourage our creatives to lead from the front. I think the culture of UAL really is supporting and encouraging that. And I'd really love to see uh, IP um, and, you know, to be included as part of those conversations that, that our creatives do go in to situations feeling confident that if people don't give them any terms or they give them a contract and expect them to just sign it thinking they don't understand their rights, that our creatives feel confident to say, what they do want, what they do think they're worth, and you know, kind of really lead in that way. And I think, you know, the, the dream would be that IP education is considered to be part of the curriculum, um, because at the moment it it just isn't at all. Um, and it's part of the student experience, it's so key to what they're they're all about. Um, and to be understood as a tool to activate positive societal change, because I think 
Elle touched upon um, Sarah's example with the open source ceramics um, publication. And I think for us, that's also really important. We've got a lot of amazing grads that are doing very entrepreneurial work and very business focused, but importantly, it's also about supporting, you know, everyone else that is also, you know, making a difference in so many different areas of our daily lives. And I think just for them to have that understanding is really kind of vital for our like, sustainable futures, really. So thank you so much for um, listening. And we'd really like to, yeah, start a conversation if anyone's got any questions or thoughts. Roxanne and Elle, thank you so much. I mean, that was, absolutely brilliant wasn't mm, it I mean it I think was. everyone I'm sure everyone would agree it's so interesting to see all the different layers of what you've done and I, I said what you were doing was innovative I, I don't know if any of us in our institutions have kind of taken this as far um, so we've got and I see a question has just popped up from Lisa Moore and I was expecting Lisa to be I was part, too. out of the the gates here so Lisa you're at the University of Creative Arts um and you're saying that knowing about ip definitely gives them a competitive edge but knowing they have to take risks to form an informed perspective so that is at the heart really of what you're doing isn't it yeah yeah i think it's about them like i say like we're increasingly finding it that we're refining what we say we're responsible for if that makes sense because we're really finding that we encourage the students to self-reflect when they come to us like if they come to us saying oh can you help me with this thing we're really worried they, they normally are but deep down they all often know what they want to do they just need a sounding board as well as obviously the more legal kind of support we can provide but I think it's yeah just encouraging them to recognize their own self-worth in this space alongside everything else they're they're doing really I think yeah. Yeah. And I think many of us, when we in our world and, and many of us in our community, we think about openness a lot. I mean, it, it's a it's big thing. We want to be open and those in library world and in in cultural heritage as well. You want to open up your collections. And I think what was really interesting in bringing and, and Sarah's case study particularly, what you've then got is, well, how it what it means to the students, what it is that they want to achieve and actually not saying that open or proprietary either one is better or worse, that they, they're they all part of a, a mix, aren't they? That you can, in some ways you want openness, but in some ways you want some element of enforcement if people are using your work without crediting it. Absolutely. Um, so I think that's really interesting to hear. I wondered whether I could follow up on that, the element of the, the protection and the enforcement, what a lot of people in that space in, in, in who are creatives they have a concern about other people taking their stuff. Fashion in particular is a, an area where people get ripped off, always have done ever since the beginning really of fashion as an industry. Um, so what kind of support are you able to give them? Presumably you don't go and um, enforce their IP for them, you're not a group of lawyers, but in some ways you have to help them through that maze. Yeah, and I think um, I'll just say a couple of bits and then Elle, I'm sure you've got things you want to follow up with. I think. To be totally candid in this space I think it's it sometimes comes from the education from the course leaders as much as it does <laughs> does from from the support we give because your point Chris about oh well that's how it's always been in the industry we get that a lot across the different industries that we're not specialists in any you know particular industry within UAL if that makes sense so it's more about um, again trying to give encourage students to have that voice to actually make that change and make that difference but I think where we do support and L do chip in if, if I say something that you don't think is right but I think we're trying to encourage them to be proactive but also be professional and really think about at the same time you being professional how are you going to then build your relationships and your reputation and people start to really um, you know be part of your community and there is that you know, I think there is a lot to be said in in having those voices and and being professional in that way. But it's it's a slow burn, totally. Elle, yeah. have you got any ads about that with the fashion? Yeah, I mean, um, Susan's just added in the chat as well something about confidence, and I think for me that's really at the core of what I feel like I I feel like we offer, um, in the sense that whether we go into sessions and people ask us questions about, um. I'm going to meet a factory and I want them to help me mock up um, and sample some of my designs. 
um, but I'm only a student like that I'm not going to go in and be able to ask them to sign an NDA and I was like why because you've said you know I'm only a student why are you defining yourself like that you have so much more value to bring than the label that you've just put on yourself and if we can help them feel confident enough to go into this factory meeting and ask the people that they meet with to sign an NDA and help the student understand what contract they are signing with this factory I feel like we've done a really um, good thing to support the student's confidence to support their their knowledge development and to support their understanding of IP in the real world and I think sometimes we do get into situations where I feel like what they need is legal advice so if we get an email and they say um, oh can you just tell me that these uh, trademark classes that I want to register in are are right and should I be thinking about anything else and would you like to you know do it with me <laughs> like do it for me walk me through the process obviously that's a much more difficult one to deal with um, in terms of um, you know not offering legal guidance and really specific um, trademark questions which can be more difficult but I think um, as Roxanne said thinking about or helping students to think about their reputation not just now in the moment as a student or recent graduate but you know how that might inform their later career and things like that are, are really central so um yeah i think we cover a huge a huge scope um across the ual but um in terms of where our advice is focused i would say you know centrally um on things like confidence are, are really really important for our work go on I, I, this is, I mean, that's really, really interesting to hear. Just one observation is how and, and you're framing it as IP as a tool and something that they can use that then helps to empower them. Because often we think about intellectual property laws as this framework that, that subjects us to do things in certain ways and we don't have power in it. There's probably more to say about that than we've got time. I know we, you wanted to pick up on Simon's question. Yeah, Simon's asked a question about um, the sort of balance between the one-to-one -one work that you do and, and being um, in a classroom given you know that one-to-ones are resource heavy and it kind of relates to a question that was in my mind as well around how this fits with the curriculum and what you know how much you're doing is kind of complementary because it, it it really feels that that you know it, it's it, it's kind of got to be embedded hasn't it for for them you know you can't just have the, the smartest and the brightest savvy students to have worked this out that there might be an issue um because you could potentially have a whole load of other students who just end up you know losing out and and kind of you know, maybe go into that factory and, and, and getting ripped off. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's a question we might really value putting back to this community, not for an answer this second. But I think one of our biggest challenges is, yes, we're a small team, that's one thing, but, you know, we're, we're making inroads. But I think it is how can we, because at the moment, everything we do is not, evaluated or measured in any way and it's hard sometimes because I want to say say to senior managers oi we're doing this stuff how can we like where, what can we do you know how can we bring it all together and I think in terms of Simon's question I think we are in, I think it's because of the time of year we're approaching like people's major final projects they're all thinking about their portfolios and showcasing their grad shows so yeah our one-to-one -one time has gone up hugely and I think because mm. Ellen I you, you can probably sense we are quite aligned in our, our thinking. It's, it's a blessing and a curse for us sometimes because we're like, oh my God, we've got all these ideas of what we can do. And with the one-to-ones, I guess we're evidence building. You know, we're, we're building up all of these case studies. And, mm. and I guess the question about the community, if anyone's got any experiences or tips on how we might position that to then put a case forward. Because I think, you know, it's, it, and we haven't talked about this because, you know, we are, very much an IP education strand, but there isn't really an IP infrastructure across the entire university. And right. so I'm having to safeguard what we are doing so that we can really focus on this. But in the meantime, it is resource heavy and we need to find you ways. You're keeping stats. That would be, you know, and, and a kind of logging everything, because I think that's that's the kind of evidence, isn't it? Um, and, and testimonials and things, you know, from from the students where you're helping them yeah uh, there's a, a question from Louise um, and I think we are fast running out of time actually but it was just about 
providing advice on, on patents as well. Um, so presumably, I mean, you're, you're, it's IP education, isn't it? It's not just copyright. So you, you yeah. do get into design rights and, and patents as well. Yeah, I think, I think that's the thing because they're working in, you know, a lot of them are working at the intersection of art, design and tech. I think patents are start, like with um, the example Elle gave for Cassie Quinn. I think patents are coming up in conversation, but as Elle said, I think a big challenge we have is we're not lawyers and, you know, we're mm. not patent attorneys. And often it's, we, we need the students to have an awareness of their processes being really valuable and not to just share them all in a work in progress where industry come in, for example. But we don't, you know, obviously unpack patents in any, any sort of detail because we no. obviously can't do that. And re realistically, it's it's so far down the line that someone would get a patent that mm. we, you know, and, and, and the last thing to say is UAL works quite differently from other universities in that, uh, students own their IP in everything they create not the university which I think can change the, the amount of support that people currently get for something like patentable ideas so I think that's where yeah. UAL is a bit on its own in that sense so but yeah we do definitely acknowledge and cover patents to a point so yeah. okay great that was so amazingly good. We would love to carry on the conversation longer, but we have reached the time. And in fact, what I would say is I think we there's a lot in here. We, we should. Yeah. And one thing that just occurred to me is we know that the Intellectual Property Office is working on an IP education framework. This is something they should be aware of your work. I think this is this is excellent stuff. Mm. Um, so I think we'll we, carry on the conversation. We, we will definitely carry definitely. on that conversation. Find other. Roxanne other, and Elle, that's yeah, brilliant. And really. That, fascinating and other avenues for working out how we might we might dig in some more if, if you're happy to do that yeah and see if we've got some ideas from some of our copyright specialists who've had to kind of you know do that same sort of balance i think mm. of you know working out that they are demonstrate you know they're, they're, they're making an impact and making a difference and and getting support to sort of value what they do so because it's, it's just yeah it should be a completely obvious but these things often aren't and there's a lot of priorities so Indeed. yeah okay. so thank you very much we yeah, are we are you. at time we know um but we will we will while we're here while we still have some people still i know that people are leaving the session of course as regulars will know um for those of you that are able to stay right to the bitter end we do have some very uh you know some more content so we will have some future webinars and um, we've taken the dates off here we realized that the date that we put in for the next session becoming a copyright specialist was actually good friday so that's not going to happen we shifted it to may now well, we, we, it's, we, we, it's, on there as a it's going to be date. the next one we we will confirm dates soon we're skipping april because yeah. that's actually when i'm finishing up my current job and starting a new one so actually I'm, and i'm going to three conferences oh, very nice conference time is here again <laughs> hopefully hopefully um, yeah, fingers crossed. there's some really good stuff happening around accessibility and our group kate facility has put together an excellent piece on accessibility we are hoping to share and have Kate talk about it in due course. Uh, yeah. Um, and then we mentioned the IPO. You said cake for a cake, minute. Not Sorry, cake, not cake. I'm just Kate, hungry. You're, you're hungry. I'm cake obsessed. Yes, no, no. Kate Vasily at Middlesex. Yes. Uh, not cake. No. Um, uh, so the IPO, we they, they are working away on their, their framework. We'll see what that comes. Yeah, we'll chase them up, see if um, we can get a date for that. And we yeah. did have earlier this week a meeting of CNAC, the Copyright Negotiating and Advisory Committee, the UUK Guild HE Group. Uh, so there are things happening and we will be, oh, Kate, excellent. A virtual cake from Kate. Kate, Kate does bake good cakes. She does. She? I yes, can remember. I remember now. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. Right. Right. I think we're at that point. At that point, that are we? That little, little, well, we need a little bit of uplift. Okay, I think. hang on, hang on. I think, I think, oh, 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 you, oh. You've oh, gone too far. So we'll have to move back one slide because now we're giving away what our one last thing is, baby. Seamless. So our webinar comes to its end, and we know you have to go. You only set aside enough for this, but there's one more gift we'd like to bestow. One last thing. Each 
Oh, good. That was the one. That jingle's quite long. If we, I mean, if it we is. want people to stay and not miss the last we thing. We might need a short So version. let's get the one last thing slide back up, which is that we have, didn't put this in the copyright news, but there is this story about the Ed Sheeran plagiarism case. It's been on the or news. Is it plagiarism or copyright infringement? Um, so, yeah, we uh, sometimes we feel, I have felt, that, that the copyright infringement cases that come up, whilst they're a good opportunity to talk about copyright stuff, um, Sometimes they, I think they can distract from some of the issues that we tend to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Cause, yeah, because they're, they're slightly unusual, aren't they? When, when something is the biggest hit of the year and there's millions of pounds at stake, then it changes people's behaviour, and that's not really how copyright in in, in many of education research contexts works. But, no, but this this was going to be our one last thing, yeah. and then something even more interesting happened yesterday <laughs> when I was listening to Jeremy Vine. Chris yeah. doesn't like Jeremy Vine. I, I'm not a huge fan of that. But um, we, we were having a listen, and um, you went back and listened to it, because I told you. And, and they had people kind of calling in about the Ed Sheeran case and talking about music and copyright. And then... If you go into this, what is it? It's one minute, one, one hour, hour worth, 30, 38 minutes into it, we yeah. get somebody who comes on to say kind of this, oh, well, you know, can you ever be original with music? And they say, he's a singer, he's a, he's a singer songwriter guy yeah. called Elliot, somebody or other. Yeah. And he goes through this kind of little piece where he moves from one song to another song with all, it's playing the same mm -hmm. chords and essentially does a massive. <laughs> plagiarist <laughs> rip off of what's called the axis of awesome which we did at ice pops in 20 the axis of awesome and their four chord song fully, fully the attributed. australian comedy band and that was yeah and that went viral years ago yeah and then and he doesn't credit them he doesn't no. say anything he kind of makes out that he invents it himself yeah so he kind of commits this kind of plagiarism copyright thing while talking about the whole thing and it, it amused us quite it a lot was, and yeah, slightly yeah, yeah. annoyed us so you so, people need to go okay yeah. finally go but we are actually i'm gonna i'm gonna stop the recording you stop, are you gonna stop the recording because we have actually created an original original work of our own haven't we going to share it with everyone i think we should stop the recording yeah. i think that anyone is watching back or anyone that needs to leave unfortunately won't go going to miss it. this yeah um it, it also might partly be because it might be an absolute train crash. So if you're going to leave, thanks a lot. Hope you've see, enjoyed it. Yeah. You want to hear our original recording. We might play it for real actually soon um, uh, but, at, at, in person at an event. Although I think, I think this, is, this is the one and only time for anyone to hear this of